Farming is a big part of how humans have consumed food for centuries now. And over that period, a multitude of changes have overtaken the farming and agricultural industry. As the science and biochemistry of food organisms keep advancing, we might take a step back today to talk about how indigenous communities and tribes farmed on the infamous Great Plains of North America. Today, we'll talk about how the Native Americans farmed on the Great Plains, the overall agricultural history of the area. What are the Great Plains? The Great Plains is an area consisting of a high plateau of grasslands that are located in parts of the United States and Canada in North America. This area is approximately the size of 1,125,000 square miles. Ironically enough, this area is now popularly known as the Great American Desert. To be specific, the Great Plains lie between the Rio Grande in the south and the delta of the Mackenzie River at the Arctic Ocean, and between the interior lowlands of the Canadian Shield on the east and the Rocky Mountains on the west. The area covers about one-third of the United States, including the 10 states Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. And in Canada, the Great Plains extend into prairie provinces like portions of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and certain Northwest territories. These high plateaus exist in varying conditions. For example, some lie extremely flat with no discernible structure while others contain tree-covered mountains. But the features that run common in most of these grasslands are low hills and incised stream valleys. Farming on the Great Plains? What it was like. You may be wondering how a large piece of land now titled the Great American Desert could be associated with farming at all. And here's how. Prior to white contact, indigenous communities did their farming and agriculture a bit differently than those on the east of the Mississippi. On the northern plains, tribes like the Man Andan tribe and the Hadadatsa tribe cultivated corn, squash, and beans for their essential needs, while being hunters as well. The tribe women were mostly took on the role of expert geneticists, would clear the land and plant, cultivate, and harvest the crops. The surplus would be stored in jug-shaped pots. But it was not just them. Many other Indians based in villages on the plains also used floodplain terraces for cropland. This is not to say that all this agriculture was simple. No. The tough prairie land often makes it difficult for farmers to cultivate the uplands. Additionally, the family fields were not that large, approximately four acres or less than that. But even so, farmers from their agricultural tribes would trade vegetables for hides and buffalo meat from nomadic tribes like crows and Lakotas. What did the Native Americans farm and eat before colonization? Colonization is not a pretty word, and as an act, it is devastating to natives. According to research, the kind of food Native Americans consumed in archaic and pre-colonization times was as widely variable as the region's indigenous people inhabited. History is a testament to the fact that English settlers often brought their own culture onto lands they colonized, and for lack of a better word, forced that culture upon locals under the guise of civilization. Seeds, corn, and nuts were grown and ground into flour using grinding stones. This flour was then used to make bread and mush, amongst other things. Apart from that, the Native Americans cultivated beans, chili, squash, nuts, wild greens, and hunted for berries and meat. Tribes residing outside of the plains would trade corn with these farmers for bison meat. Farming in the Great Plains done by Native Americans. Agriculture in Great Plains has always been as rewarding as it has been risky, as droughts, grasshoppers, and early frosts have kept the land unpredictable. As such, even those farming on the lands always had secondary means of food production. Maize was the most important crop produced by the grasslands, but gardens also included vegetation like beans and squash to grow. Villages sat atop bluffs and terraces overlooking these gardens, which the residents had carved into the fertile floodplains below. The earliest known crops that were cultivated on these lands were known to be sunflowers, amaranth, and chenopods. Not only that, tobacco was a crop significant to many native tribes for ritualistic reasons as well as its value in trade. And agriculture was an innate part of these tribes as the annual cycle of their seasons consisted of planting, hoeing, harvesting, and processing these crops. Not only that, the agriculture that native farmers employed was impressive in its own right. Semi-subterranean earth lodge villages, bison scapula hoes, were used for the agricultural aspects of their day-to-day -day existence, while ceramic pots were used to cook corn and beans. Longevity of agricultural life in America pre-colonization. One such secret to this long 
lasting period of agriculture is definitely the sophisticated risk management strategies employed by female farmers in native regions. Records by archaeologists and anthropologists reveal that a wide variety of crops like maize, beans, and squash were carefully developed and selected to be planted and subsequently produced under different conditions for maximum yield and a risk-free growth cycle. An example is the Mondan tribe, which planted at least 13 varieties of corn when they came in contact with European Americans. That, along with their gardens being widely dispersed geographically and intercropped, and beans being planted amongst the corn because they returned nitrogen back into the soil and kept it from going arid from all that corn production, meant that the natives were pretty much covered from all bases. The harvest cycles, what do we know? The first harvest of the season was always the green corn harvest, which typically commenced in mid-August. This green corn was consumed after being roasted or boiled and shelled using clam shells. It was then set out to dry in the sun, and this dried corn was then boiled with beans, squash, or dried meat. Sometimes dried corn would be processed with mortar and pestle to create cornmeal. And despite all this, corn was a crop used sparingly, especially when the food was available. For replantation, particularly good quality corn ears were saved to serve as seed corn the following season. After that, another major harvest of the season came by in September and October in the form of a ripe corn harvest. This corn was husked, and around 50 or more brightly tinted ears would be braided together and hung on drying scaffolds in the villages. And after this corn was dry, it would be stored in parfetches, or in one of the many bell-shaped cash pits located under the ground of earth. These cash pits would usually hold up to 20 to 30 bushels of corn, beans, dried pumpkins, squash, and sunflower seeds. And though yields varied from year to year and were respectful of the region, the harvest took place per season. Most fields managed to produce an average of 20 bushels per acre. And no good harvest was complete without mutually beneficial trading with the nomads of the basins for bison meat and animal hides. The beginning of the end. As mentioned, colonization rarely brings the kind of satisfaction large ruling empires seek and often end up erasing vital parts of pre-existing culture on native lands. During the early 19th century, the acquisition of Native American lands and their distribution to settlers by the federal government at the time directly resulted in the beginning of the decline of most of these specific agricultural practices on the Great Plains. Missionaries and government agents were assigned to educate and teach Native American farmers European American agricultural traditions. This was all part of how the colonial settlers tried to suppress Native American culture, like forcefully sending indigenous kids into schools designed to remove the native values instilled in them. A farming-related example of this was when these agents would provide instructions to Native American men who viewed farming as women's work. These farmers also promoted wheat over crops and insisted on row cultivation rather than intercultivation, a practice traditionally used in Native American agriculture. Beyond the audacious teaching, governments failed to provide adequate equipment, training, or seeds to make the transition into this new agricultural method smoother. In Canada, agents from Ontario knew nothing of prairie farming and would encourage methods that were highly unsuitable, the Dawes Act and its resulting atrocity. While this was happening, the United States government responded with the General Allotment Act, also known as the Dawes Act, in the 1880s that allowed the president to subdivide these tribe reservations into private parcels of land. These parcels of land would then be allotted to individual members of each tribe. This system was designed to de-tribalize the natives in order to assimilate them into a more civilized society, which just means mainstream white society. This act became one of the most devastating acts of the natives to ever be passed by Congress. Under the act, not consented to by the native indigenous tribes living on those lands, each head of the household was given at most 160 acres and at least 80 acres of land. The rest of this land was divided into a surplus that would be owned privately by Europeans. The land that indigenous people had access to was not owned by them, but given to them in the form of a patent or trust, one that claimed that the government would hold title to the land and trust for the benefit of the nominal Indian owner for a period of 25 years before it could be owned. By the time this act came to a close in 1934, Indian held land in the U.S. had dropped from 138 million acres to a mere 48 million acres. And of that land, almost half was now arid or semi-arid desert. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching.